Hey, peaceful pirates. Welcome to another edition of Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the internet. I've got another amazing guest. It's been just one after another lately. Rick Valvinia, if I said that right. And I think the name actually means something like Falcon Wing. Uh, and uh, he is uh, the founder of the Swedish Pirate Party. He's also involved in uh, <clears throat> something you may know about, Pirate Bay. Uh, he's also written a book called uh, Swarmwise, which is how he started a political party in Sweden. And they became very popular very quickly and raised a lot of money and actually got into government to some extent. So we're going to ask him all about that because I'm doing the same thing in Canada right now with the Libertarian Party of Canada with their election coming up in a few months. So I want to see if I can get any tips from him. And this is also going to be very interesting for me because he has a very similar background to me. He's about the same age. He started out on a Commodore VIC-20 computer, which I remember very well. I was on an Apple II Plus, and I had literally my whole room was full of pirated games. And it sounds like he was doing the same thing, too. And back then, just so people know, I hear people complaining about how slow their internet is. Uh, to download a one megabit game, which is all you could really fit on a floppy disk, took usually one to two days. And usually it was kind of cut out halfway through and have to start over again because someone called your house and you got a busy signal and it would cut off your internet. So this could be a fun and interesting conversation. Really happy to have him on. It's Rick Valvigny Val, uh, coming in from Stockholm, Sweden. And I'd like to thank you for coming on. But uh, Rick, I have to ask you first, how did you become an anarchist? Well, th first, Jeff, thanks for having me on the show. It's an honor and a privilege. Uh, how did I become an anarchist? Well, you know, uh, at some point you kind of realize that today's construct is plain immoral. And even though you don't find a better alternative right off, you're still not content with the fact that you're supporting an immoral construct. Kind of like this, this question that when slavery was abolished once, everybody said, well, who's going to pick the cotton? And just because I don't have an answer for the question, who's going to build the roads, that doesn't make today's construct any more moral. Or rather, I do have an answer to who's going to build it. The question isn't who's going to build roads. The, the question is if we don't have a government who's going to ban entrepreneurs from building roads where they're needed. But that's a, sec that's a separate issue. So how did I become an anarchist? How did I start questioning all of this? And <laughs> I guess uh, this is not an answer most politicians would like to hear. But the deeper you go into the rabbit hole, the more corruption you see, the more you realize that can you really salvage this shit? Can, do, do you really see a way out of this? Can you really burst this bubble? How do you fix this? Now, one person can make a difference. One person can really make a, a whole lot of difference. You can start a movement. You can change the world for the better. Nobody can change everything, but everybody can change something. So, I'm not sure I would identify as an anarchist if people ask me i do identify as libertarian but deep down i can't really justify anything about the anarchist position yeah it's the only morally sound position yeah. obviously because every other position includes a violence and initiation exactly. of force uh, and it's funny because they call anarchists, well, they, uh, there's a lot of different people calling themselves anarchists who aren't, but a lot of people think anarchists are dangerous and we're the only right. ones saying, hey, stop beating people up and stealing their money. That's all we're saying. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? I mean, I tweeted earlier today that there are those who say that taxation is theft. And I, I insisted that that's obviously not true because taxation includes a threat of force and therefore the correct term is robbery. Or extortion. Well, extor does extortion include threat of force? It could, I guess. Yeah, if I understand the word extortion, it generally means that you go up to someone, you say, hey, give me your money, or, and you've got a gun sitting there, uh, so you're kind of extorting them for the money. So it, you can call it robbery as well. But yeah, it's, uh, it's, a, it's even worse than just regular theft. Yeah, that, that, that's what my point. So that pretty much divided my following into two halves immediately, which was kind of my point. I mean, I like making people think. Yeah, it's too bad not many people do. Uh, but uh, let's get into, what's your, uh, you know, to be honest, I don't know your entire history. I don't know the history of Pirate Bay. I don't know a lot about the Swedish Pirate Party, but I've heard about them all. I've heard about you, and I know snippets, so I really want to get some background on what's been going on. So uh, what's your involvement in Pirate Bay, and where's Pirate Bay at right now? I know there's been a lot of stuff going on over the last few years. 
Actually, let's start a little earlier. I mean, you were sure. spot on when, when you did the, the intro that. I started out on a VIC-20. You, you, you were copying games by sneaker nets at the point, meaning that you were actually carrying discs to friends. One disc, one disc would fit maybe 160 kilobytes or something like that. These huge five and a quarter inch discs, and they were one-sided. So you had a little... Well, it'd be two-sided if you had a uh, exactly, hole puncher. You, exactly. You'd, you'd punch <laughs> them open to be able to, to save stuff on the reverse side as well, which they weren't made for, and so on and so forth. So I, I think a lot of people starting out with copying and sharing, which is fundamentally a good thing today, are missing out on the, the very linear history of this, as in... When you grew up in the 70s, everybody was sharing music with each other on these cassette tapes, right? I don't have a cassette tape here. It's kind of ancient. But uh, they, people can look it up on Wikipedia, the compact cassette. And the early computers were storing programs on the same medium in a cassette recorder. So you went from copying, ca copying music on these tapes to copying computer programs and games on these tapes. It came, came very, very natural. And once the habit of copying games and, and stuff for each other was there, the medium didn't man, matter anymore. You just sort of carried on the habit. And so, yeah, I mean, the entire IT entrepreneur generation grew up on copying. And I think a lot of politicians in power today are completely clueless about that fact. Yeah, I remember those old days. It was pretty uh, fun. I, you know, like thinking back to it, like there was no way as a kid I could afford any of those games. Uh, but there was always somebody in your neighborhood who had a job. He was like 17 or 20 or sometimes even 30 or 40. And he'd buy a Castle Wolfenstein or whatever for $20 <laughs> or whatever it was. And then he'd copy it for you, you know. So, yeah, that was, uh, that was back in the old days with bulletin board systems. Oh, yeah. Uh, where... Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that, was, that, was, that was lovely. The good old days. <laughs> And I was and I was so jealous of you guys with your Commodores because you had color. So I, I didn't have color for the <laughs> longest time. I had the green screen or the orange screen. And I was like, oh, my friend, I remember playing Archon on the Commodore 64. And I thought that was the coolest game ever. It's basically chess with like mm -hmm. different sort of fighter symbols. And I was like, whoa, it's all color and cassette tapes. This is the future. <laughs> it was, wasn't it? Uh, uh, I mean, it, it took me quite a, quite a while to realize that copying is not wrong in any way, shape, or form. I mean, it's exercising your property rights. You are observing something. You're observing a pattern of ones and zeros. And you're exercising your property rights when you're instructing your computer to arrange your media um, to, what you are, to the pattern you are observing. And if somebody else can forbid you to exercise those property rights, then that's a monopoly we're dealing with. It's a monopoly over a pattern of ones and zeros. And, and that's deeply, deeply immoral because when you look at it, copying is what's building civilization. It, it, it's, if people were not allowed to copy each other, we would still be plowing the fields by hand. It's only, yeah, absolutely. It's only gone. This is, people sometimes use a term named uh, abbreviated IP for these kinds of laws, and I insist every time I hear it that the proper readout of that term is industrial protectionism. Yeah, the uh, another thing for as far as theft goes, uh, if someone has a, a, a song on their computer and they send it to you, they still have that song. So even if you, you know, you know, it, it's, it's not theft because the person still has what they originally had. It's just a duplication. And as you pointed out, if we don't, if, you know, everything's a copy of something to some extent, uh, everything we've ever done is, is built upon sort of copying. You listen to musicians and they're like, oh yeah, I took this from that guy. That, I learned this uh, way of doing things from that guy and I made it into my own thing. Uh, so yeah, the uh, whole IP thing is crazy. And of course, in order to have IP, you need a big government to watch everyone and make sure they're, yeah, sure. they're not doing this sort of thing, yeah, which sure. is ridiculous. And, and I mean, of course, the whole music industry and everything it's changed the game for sure but there's still a music industry uh it's uh, they have to go out and perform a bit more now because uh, they're not making quite as much although i hear it is almost back to the same levels it was before things like napster now with things like itunes because a lot of people don't want to go through the trouble of going and finding these things they just want to hey it's a dollar i'll click and there i got it no problem uh, that's, so that's the thing right i mean we've 
we've seen the this change in behavior go through and the artists are making 214 percent as much money as they did as before sharing we've seen those numbers but the thing is it doesn't matter if maintaining civil liberties stands between your you and your business model then you don't get to keep that business model no single entrepreneur gets to dismantle civil liberties just because they can't make money otherwise it just doesn't play into it and what i mean by civil liberties here is that i mean i've been doing this for for decades right so i i am i'm kind of deep into it but basically i mean you're a reporter a new generation reporter but still a reporter right and we have a digital communications channel in between us here now i can use that digital communications channel to leak a scandal to you about government corruption and mismanagement of resources or i can send you a piece of music and the only way to find out which is which is to listen to all of it you cannot maintain the postal secret and enforce the copyright monopoly at the same time the mere concept of private communication has become mutually exclusive with this old distribution monopoly for an entertainment industry and given the choice between have maintaining a monopoly for an entertainment industry or the concept of private communications as such it's obvious to me which way the scales tip yeah, absolutely. Hopefully, Immortal Technique. I don't know if you heard about him, the rapper guy. Uh, here's this. He's a, uh, I think he's what, what you would call an anarcho communist, uh, but he, he hates capitalism. But so he was trying to sell uh, CDs at his concert, and outside they were selling copies of the CDs, and him <laughs> and his buddies went out and beat them up. Uh, so he's a little confused because he's trying to sell the CDs, so I guess he is a capitalist. Uh, but then at the same time, he wants to enforce his uh, intellectual property rights through, through violence. Uh, so he's a little confused. Hopefully, he gets his. Uh, mind sorted out a little bit. Um, I want to get into the, the Swedish Pirate Party. This is an incredibly fascinating story. Uh, it almost seemed to come out of nowhere. And uh, you had, I believe, 7% of the government. Uh, you were elected to 7%. I think you started around 2006. And by 2009, you had 7% of the government. And I don't know the rest of the story. I don't even know how you started it. So give us the whole background and, and what happened and, and what happened after you were in government. Give us the whole story sure. on that. I mean, we, we started talking a little bit about how this culture evolved right i mean us who were born in the 70s we grew up with it it was not it was not that we discovered sharing it was always there and it was the politicians who just didn't understand the world they were living in right so in um one thing that was peculiar about sweden in the dot-com boom was that we had a broadband rollout very early when the rest of Europe was still on ISDN and ADSL lines, entrepreneurs here were hell-bent on out-competing the telco monopolies, the old national telco monopolies. So we had, five, we had apartment blocks fibered wholesale before the turn of the century. I had fiber to this apartment in 1998, a, um, which is running now on, on 100 megabit full duplex. I think it was 10. Uh, and at the start, and quickly upgraded to 100. To 100. That's interesting and because uh, in 1998 as well, I was in Vancouver, Canada. I moved to this one neighborhood. It was the first place to put in fiber optics. Mm -hmm. uh, so we were very similar in that way that there we just go. got onto it at that point. There you go. And the, the observation here in Sweden was that when you give this kind of technology, not just to geeks and nerds, but to everybody, it kickstarts a public discussion on how this technology can and maybe even should be used. So everybody was sharing everything they could by the turn of the century. And Hollywood didn't like that. So in 2001, they established um, an enforcement bureau here to educate the public on the importance of the copyright monopoly to society. And it's no exaggeration that they were sl just slow, slightly late to the game. And this enforcement agency was called the Anti-Pirate Bureau. Fast forwarding two years, a couple of artists and musicians grew tired of this one-sided message being peddled in old media all the time. So they decided to take a stand and call themselves something that signaled that they were actually in favor of the future. So they just removed the anti and called themselves the Pirate Bureau. 
And this group had a, they were a smash hit with the media logic because all of a sudden there was a counterpoint to what, what the industry was claiming. All, instead of just accepting a press release and sort of making a small notice about it, the journalism could play the entire he said, she said register and make great, art, great articles about it. So they became instant heroes for a generation, these Pirate Bureau guys. And they were also the ones who founded the Pirate Bay in 2003, in the fall of 2003. So I was still looking on the sidelines when this ha happened, sort of just seeing the development. And in 2005, there was yet another harshening of the copyright monopoly in Sweden, which didn't make sense at all, which would criminalize downloading from unauthorized sources. And I frequently talk about analog equivalent rights, as in, if you translate this to the analog world, would it make sense? And if you're listening to a radio, would it make sense to find you if the radio didn't have a license for the song it was playing? As in, no, it wouldn't, because you wouldn't have a clue, and you shouldn't even have to have a clue, right? And so this was just shameless mail order legislation from the big labels. So that essentially, if you were running an indie band, if you were running a startup competitor to the big labels, there should be suspicion, people shouldn't dare use your services, and so on and so forth. So this was completely shameless. But what really struck my, what really struck me here was that everybody was discussing this over breakfast tables and hotel bars, over family dinners at universities, over coffee at workplaces. Everybody was discussing this except the politicians. And that is an exceedingly rare situation. That's, those are usually the first guys to kind of have their finger up in the air like this and kind of feel where the wind was blowing. They weren't even aware that this discussion was taking place everywhere. And that really set me thinking, what does it take to get their attention? At the point, I, fi I, I did the math, there were 1.2 million file shares in Sweden at, the, at that time, there are about 3 million now, and I figured that if only one-fifth of these people are, frankly, pissed off enough at, at being demonized like this by the establishment, and if that emotion can be vote driving, then we'll actually have a shot at parliament. And once we take the jobs of the politicians who are peddling this fantasy, once you take their jobs, then it becomes personal. And if it becomes personal, they'll actually start to care. And that worked that plan worked out brilliantly. I, I still have the original draft of the first, very first Pirate Party page. It's ugly as fuck, really, as in, <laughs> it's unbelievably unpolished. But it says there that we can, we can take 225,000 votes. That was the math I did in uh, 20, early 2006. And three and a half year, years later, in the European Parliament elections, we took 240 225,915 votes. So the plan was just beautiful. It, it just worked out. And I think what, what, what this goes to show is that not only did we become the largest party in the most coveted sub-30 demographic, we did that on less than 1% of the competition's budget. Less than 1%. And that was entirely due to working uh, with communities, working online, working as a big swarm of volunteers rather than a, an old hierarchy cutting checks for PR firms. Yeah, that's great. And that's uh, what I really wanted to hear about was uh, because we are just basically starting a, a new sort of thing in Canada with this Libertarian Party. It's been around for about 30 years, but it's really never been anything. And now it's actually being talked about as actually affecting this upcoming election. And so I really wanted to hear your uh, how that happened. And uh, it's very interesting. I think a lot of the Libertarian Party of Canada people will be watching this video and, and uh, hopefully getting your book as well, Swarmwise. Um, uh, first of all, how much did you, I heard you raise like quite a large 
amount of money because of what you're doing, which is what the Libertarian Party of Canada needs right now. And then secondly, I also heard once you were in, there was some problems. I heard all kinds of stories or rumors that uh, your party got a little bit co-opted. Is that true? Now, let's take it one at a time. I mean, building an organization like this from, from starting out until you actually have a nationwide organization of feet on the ground. That's not just one phase. That's, that's climbing through many phases, each of which has a cha its challenges. And like you say, I describe all of them in this book, Swarmwise, which I want to emphasize, I'm not advocating buying. This is not a, this is not a sell because you can download it for free off my website. I'm, I had this experience. I want to share the experience. That's what's driving me here. So you can download this off of falkvinge.net slash books. And it's, it's a PDF, just go get it. And a couple of experiences there is that a lot of this is just very, very basic psychology. As in, you cannot manage a group larger than 150 people, stuff like that. Once you reach certain group sizes, you gotta break them apart or you'll hit a glass ceiling. And if you're not aware of that, you'll run into this obstacle and you won't understand what's stopping you. That this is ba very basic things in the human psyche. Uh, things like, you, uh, like attention is reward. If somebody does something good, just call them out on it. Hey, great job. That's all it takes. Stuff like just to illustrate what we were doing, I mean, 20, 2008, 2009, this was the old golden age of blogs, right? This was before the Facebook stream and the Twitter stream really kicked in. So one thing we did was when people mentioned, their, mentioned the Pirate Party by name on their blog, regardless of context, just doing a string match for, for the party name, we would put their blog post up on our front page on full automatic and what that did was to give their blog a huge traffic spike if they had had 20 visitors a day they would all of a sudden get an influx of thousands of visitors from from our front page just for mentioning our party name and the key thing to realize here is that attention is reward when these people are sitting down to write their next blog post what topics will they be considering and that's how we became the most talked about party by a huge margin ahead of this ahead of this election now it should be said that we, we spread outside of sweden as well i mean we, we sweden was needed as a spark plug the idea is that if you change europe you're changing the world because the Euro europe is the world's largest economy and you cannot maintain a protectionist monopoly structure without all the all the major economies agreeing to it. You can, certainly agree, you can certainly uphold a property structure, but not a protectionist monopoly structure that infringes on other people's property rights. So the, the funny thing is that the European Union has, um, its member states are very independent, which means that each state is at liberty to change its laws. For example, it's, inter it's laws on industrial protectionism, like copyright monopolies and patent monopolies. However, if the U.S. were to apply trade sanctions, it cannot apply those trade sanctions against the individual country. It would have to apply them against the European Union as a whole. And the U.S. can't win in that scenario because the European Union is a larger economy. You can only win in a trade sanction scenario if you're applying them against a smaller economy like Cuba. If you're applying them against a larger economy, you're getting hurt more than they are. So we actually have found an Achilles heel here and we're still executing on that plan. The thing is politics kind of moves at a glacial scale when you come from the internet. You know, you're used to changing the world on a weekend and you realize all of a sudden that there's four or five years between elections, that, that's glacial. So anyway, my point is that Sweden was needed as a spark plug. I needed to show people that you can actually stand up, run for office and get elected because we can communicate faster, uh, more efficiently and at a much larger scale than any generation before us. And that's, a, that's an ability we can and should be using. 
So once I had shown the world that, you know, we, we can put people into office. We just put two people into the European Parliament here. And we did that entirely off of donations from students. So once, once that was done, I mean, there, there are no power parties in some 70 countries, each at different stages of, of maturity, of, um, of growth. You had the uh, German power party, which was up at two digits of, of uh, support for some time. You have the Icelandic power party, which uh, has been the country's largest for some time. And uh, I think I should clarify here there that being, having 7% at an election, if you're from the U.S., that, that sounds really bad. Because uh, if you're taking 7% in the U.S., you get nothing, nothing, and more nothing. However, if you're taking 7% in a proportional system, which is in most of Europe, then you're getting 7% of the seats. So votes are allocated by percent at a national count, rather than being allocated from each, each small constituency. So getting, getting above the threshold to get seats, that, I mean, that, that, that was a absolute smash spark across the entire movement. We won, we can do this. Now we know we can do this. Yeah, that's great. Uh, yeah, I've seen that happening all over the place. In Canada, there's a data provincial election re recently in a very conservative area that's been conservative for uh, pr pretty much it's ever since it started. And uh, But the conservatives have been so bad that they decided to elect a fully communist NDP government uh, in the last election. And these people didn't even really start. A lot of them are students. Some of them are still in university. Uh, one was like traveling on like backpacking throughout Europe when she won. Um, and this all happened in a matter of weeks or months. So I've got some really high hopes for what we can do in Canada to try to change the system a little bit there, or at the very least get this message out to people uh, that uh, we need to change the system dramatically, if not get rid of it altogether eventually. Yeah, um, I mean, it, it can be done. I, I've looked at the numbers. Even in I first pass the post system where you're, where you're electing one person per constituency, usually the voter turnout is so low that you will get one person elected if you reach 20 percent of the electorate total of the electorate total not of the vote total but of the electorate total and i mean we can do that we we know how to do that already and it's not that we are converting votes who are set in their ways who are voting republican who are voting democrat who are voting whatever what we see is rather that people who have entirely lost hope in politics as a viable avenue for change is seeing that there, there's some there's they can actually make a difference again i mean I've, yeah. I've got people coming up to me in the street saying that rick i haven't voted in 20 years thank you and i mean th th that gets to you yeah, that's great. So I'm definitely going to I'm going to be checking out your book and uh, passing along to everyone in, in Canada that I'm working with and see if we can get that going before October here and uh, make, uh, you know, at least get people woken up to that there is change coming and we're going to change it. We're not going to stop. Um, I want to ask you about Bitcoin because I know you got into that uh, a number of years ago, I think around 2011, if I read correctly. Yep. Are you doing something with Bitcoin right now? I heard you're doing some sort of new venture. I am. Uh, I'm. I'm looking at, rather than just looking at Bitcoin in isolation, I'm, I'm sort of testing it out as, can you run a startup today and going at it unbanked? As an, I, have the, I have the ambition of uh, creating a new startup and getting a couple of thousand, thousand colleagues, use, again, using this war methodology, cut, cutting costs and, and scaling out every, everywhere you can. So people are ne not necessarily working full time, rather they're, they're contributing, kind of like Uber and, and all this in the sharing economy, that they're contributing when and how much they want and, and they're getting a cuts of the revenue in a completely transparent model. But the key thing here with Bitcoin is that you can pay people so quickly, so transparently and so precisely that the old banking system doesn't stand a chance. As in, I don't know where my colleagues are. I don't know what country they're in, and I don't care. <laughs> as long as yeah. they're contributing, as long as they're delivering to the overall revenue, uh, they're getting paid on automatic, and I don't have to deal with one single central bank about it. 
So that's what I'm doing with Bitcoin right now, as in trying to take it to the next level. Can you run an unbanked startup? And there are certainly challenges there, Jeff. Like a lot, there, there are a lot of payment services that accept Bitcoin and give you central bank money out in the other end. There are very few services that accept credit cards on your behalf and give you Bitcoin in the other hmm. end. As in, there are plenty of services for the legacy business is to have uh, an arm into the new world. There are not yet a lot of services for new businesses to have an arm into the legacy world. So the bridge is pretty much, uh, it's, uh, it's a one bridge way bridge at this point. Yeah, no, that's interesting to see how quickly it's gone the other way now. And now that's uh, going to be probably a more desired service as people are going, especially in Greece and places like that. I Some know. credit card on your website and then you get Bitcoin. You don't want any euros or anything like that. You can't even get it out of the bank at, at this moment in time. So, know, yeah, this I is mean, very exciting. The Greek people thought that money in the bank was their money, right? <laughs> and I mean, if yeah, you've been... The old days. <laughs> I know, right? And I mean, if you've been studying, if you've been looking at money theory, if you've been looking at how this happens, you know that money in the bank is legally not your money. It is legally the bank's money. And you hold a legitimate claim on that money toward the bank. But that claim can be, become null and void for a number of reasons. <laughs> Yeah, there's so many countries that have uh, put into legislation bank bail-ins now. We saw the first one in 2013 in Cyprus. Yep. Uh, they're talking about it in Greece right now. Uh, yep. Canada, the U.S., Australia, all of Europe have put in bank in bail-in uh, legislation, which essentially means if the banks have any problems, and they always do because they're all bankrupt, and all they're doing is taking your money and gambling with it and government bonds, which are all worthless, mm -hmm. uh, then they can just take your money to pay for their, uh, uh, their problems. I know, right? I mean, yeah. have you looked at housing markets in Europe and for that matter in the U.S.? Yeah. I know the U.S., but I don't know single, Europe very well. Every single bank that hands out mortgages like candy, they're essentially <laughs> speculating between banks using, housing, using houses and homes as collateral and letting the people who live there take all the risk. Yeah, it's crazy. And that's that's uh, what's driving people. That's what's driving prices up, and that's not that's uh, that's not just going to hold. I mean, that's a house of cards waiting to, waiting to come crashing down. And when that happens, just as you say, it, banks are going to save themselves first. And that's another red line throughout history. You cannot. You just cannot count on a government. <coughs> <laughs> I'll start talking here while you're doing that. Actually, I want to play the South Park uh, a little clip right now. It's the one where the guy goes, the uh, kid goes into the bank and he gives his money to the banker and he goes right away, one second, and it's gone. So I'll play that video right now. We'll come right back and hopefully you've uh, cleared your throat. I got a hundred dollar check from my grandma and my dad said I need to put it in the bank so it can grow over the years. Well, that's fantastic. A really smart decision, young man. We can put that check in a money market mutual fund. Then we'll reinvest the earnings into foreign currency accounts with compounding interest, and it's gone. So we're back. Uh, I think uh, Rick's still alive here. <laughs> I just got a little... Just got a little something in my throat. Sorry about that. No so what, problem, I, no. what I was going to say is that what you realize once you've looked at how cyc these cycles of history keep repeating is that a government will always, always save itself first. When the shit hits the fan, and it does, it <laughs> does in cycles, no government is coming to your aid the government will always save itself first. Yeah, and uh, these cycles seem to come in seven-year increments, as I've been discovering. I just did a video on it. Uh, I'll put it in the links down below, just called Expo uh, Shemitah Exposed. I'm predicting that the next major crisis is going to happen in this fall. So if you haven't looked into Bitcoin or anything like that yet, uh, and you have the, all your money in a bank, check out that video. I'll put the link down below because I think more and more people are going to get Greeked over the next uh, year, and uh, you don't want to be one of them. Yeah, uh, one I, of the questions. I, yeah, I would ahead. both agree and disagree with that. Uh, if you're looking at the major collapses, they they're not points in time. Rather, they they are processes where one domino topples another, and topples another, and topples another. 
So if you look at the uh, 1929 crash, you can see that this was a drawn out process. If you look at the 1920, you can see the same thing and so on and so forth. So I, I tend to say, I'm agreeing with you that we're gonna see a, some major tears this fall. But my phrasing of it is that we're now in month four of a 24 month collapse scenario. Yeah, no, when I say a collapse in the fall, actually I'm saying it could be the beginning of a collapse, uh, but I'm expecting a lot of things to really come to a head this fall, and then yep. probably for the next few years just get worse and worse. And so the faster you can kind of get out of uh, the, these banking systems, the better. Um, so uh, I wanted to ask you, you get because gold, you're- get Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah, precious metals, Bitcoin, uh, all that kind of thing. And I have that all in the video down below. It's called Ex uh, Shemitah Exposed. And uh, so you click on that after this video. And uh, so I wanted to ask you, you're, you're kind of a techie guy and you're into things like the blockchain and Bitcoin mm -hmm. and, and Pirate Bay and all those sort of things. I, I'm, I'm wondering if you have any uh, thoughts on how we can get the internet more decentralized. I know there's a number of people working on that, uh, MadeSafe and a uh, number of others. What's your thoughts? Can we get to that point fairly soon? We are. I, I'd say we are right in the middle of that process, Jeff. And the problem isn't uh, the technical part. The problem is that capitalism works. And why that is a problem in this case is that it's much more efficient to run a centralized service. Decentralization has a cost to it, uh, which, is, which, which we can kind of see every time you try to build a service. If you, if you need multiple nodes sharing the data, then coding that, I mean, it's hard. It's really hard. Building a centralized service is much easier, which is why I see a lot of centralized services. So the reason we are seeing the, the internet de starting to re-decentralize is that the cost of centralization became clear when the Snowden documents arrived. If you have a centralized service, then that centralized service is susceptible to the government where that service is running. And there is not one single negotiation, one single quotation, one single RFI where, where you'll see the supplier's government as part of the threat model. But that's what's happened. Everybody right now is working to decentralize. Again, going back to a decentralized model, I should say, because, I mean, before we had Facebook, before we had Twitter, before we had all these services, we were decentralized. We had blogs, we had mail, we, everybody was kind of working on, on their little corner, and we were linking back and forth in, in a beautiful crisscross of complete chaos. And from this emerged centralized services, because they were more efficient, capitalism works. Only now do we see the, that the externalities of that efficiency was that governments could, could use force to take away our civil liberties. And people are not content seeing that, so we're seeing a lot of development towards decentralization again. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it's great and fascinating to watch and exciting and so many things going on. Uh, so uh, this has been fascinating. I like to keep these a little shorter. I know you got things to do. It's about one in the morning, your time there. And um, I, I wanna give you an open invite to Anarchapoco. It's our anarcho-capitalist, the largest, the first and largest anarcho-capitalist event in the world in Acapulco, February 19th to 21st. You've got an February open invite to that. 19th to 21st? <laughs> 19th to 21st, I can tell you later. Oh, yeah. um, and we're gonna have a lot of big Bitcoin guys, a lot of technology guys as well, Bitcoin guys, Roger Veer. Uh, and so a lot of the focus is on, on things like that. And it's on the beach in Acapulco in February. So it's a little bit better than Stockholm at that time of year. Oh, you betcha. Thanks for the <laughs> invite. I've already made, made a note of it. And, and thank you so much for inviting me on the show. It's been an honor and a privilege. Yeah, no, it's been a, a real, uh, really great to get to know you. It's kind of funny how it turned out because uh, when I first found out about you, I was like, I have to talk to Rick. <laughs> and uh, I, I was like, okay, he lives in Sweden. Who do I know in Sweden? I was like, Suzanne tarkowski Tempelhoff, a past Anarchist guest. So I went on Facebook and I said, uh, Suzanne, do you know Rick uh, Farhin? Uh, Fal 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 Sorry, I can never say your name right. And uh, she's like, yeah, he's in my house right now. And I'm like, <laughs> small world. Uh, and uh, it took us a little while to get this interview going, but we finally did, and it's been a real pleasure. Do you want to let anyone know about any of the things you're working on, like this uh, Bitcoin startup sort of stuff you're doing, or uh, you want to give them some websites to go to to check out your stuff? If I, can get, well, if I can give you one final word, it would be the reminder of 
checking out my book. It is for free, and everybody who starts reading it say they can't put it down until they close the last page. So it's on falkvinge.net slash books, and if you can't remember that, just Google Swarm Wise. One word, nine letters, Swarm Wise. That's great. So everyone in the Canadian Libertarian Party of Canada, you have to download that book. It's free, for Christ's sake, uh, which is, uh, you know, makes total sense, being uh, Rick is a big uh, anti-IP law person. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, we'll definitely be checking that out. If you like this video, like, subscribe, share down below. That's how we can also spread this information. Uh, so another great episode of Anarchast. So this is Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the Internet. Peace, love, and anarchy. When you consider that you have to spend all your time basically unteaching what your kids just learned. So not only must the government recognize natural rights, but the government can't disparage them. Unfortunately, the people in the government have a hole in their copy uh, where the Second Amendment is, the Ninth Amendment, and the Tenth Amendment. So, you know, this is not so saintly. I mean, you know, because he's got the reputation of favoring, uh, you know, ending slavery. But he wasn't an opponent of slavery. Uh, the abolitionists were opponent of slavery, but not Abe Lincoln. I mean, the actual argument and the explanation is pretty darn simple. I mean, it's, it's so simple as to almost be self-evident. I mean, things like self-ownership and the non-aggression principle, it's, it takes about three seconds to demonstrate that government can't be legitimate. Well, I, th I think uh, human beings have the right to shape their own reality. And that's what's been taken away from us. We are participating involuntarily in a system that shapes our reality for us. And the first step is to not allow that. You're paying off your debt, you have to pay off your car loans, your mortgage, you have to maybe even live with your parents, and then you look back at your life and you did nothing. You never challenged yourself, you never experienced anything, you never lived your life because you kept doing what the machine told you to do. From Acapulco, Mexico, this is Anarchast.